Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be in the house. Got it, man. Hey, I'm excited about communion. Uh, I think finally we are having it on Sunday morning. After all the lockdowns and all of that, uh, we were hiding. (laughs) No, I'm joking. Um, But it's good to to come together as a body of Christ and take communion. I'm also excited about uh, Mother's Day. Um, I have a godly mom who I would not be here um, if it wasn't for her. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for her, if you know what I mean, but, but that too. Um, and, uh, we just want to celebrate our, our amazing moms who work 24 seven to pray for us and, and, and serve us. When I moved out of the house the first time, well, there was only one time, but when I moved out of the house, I went from coming home every single day to a house that's clean. All my clothes all stacked in a nice way and food, and the house is warm, and then I moved out, and the mess I left in the apartment, I came to it, and I was like, okay, wait a second, that, 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 that needs to change. Uh, so he forced me to become an adult pretty quickly, and I realized how much I appreciate my mom. Um, so with that said, if you have your Bibles, uh, would you open with me to Ezekiel 7? Uh, we're going to read this chapter, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go into the sermon. Ezekiel 7, uh, 37, rather, I'll be reading from the ESV translation. It should be on the screen if you don't have a Bible. But I encourage you, if you have your phone or your Bible with you, they open there. Uh, we'll start with verse 1. It says this, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me, brought me out in the Spirit. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of the spirit, uh, out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them. And behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very, very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, God, you know. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and I'll cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and as I was commended, as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them And flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to them, uh, to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I'll put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I'll place you in your land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declared the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me, and we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for this opportunity to preach the word. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord in this place. And Father, I'm I'm reminded of the time you looked upon a crowd and you saw they were harassed and helpless. And Father, you had compassion on them. And this morning, Father, I think there's going to be a lot of people here that maybe they are just weary and they feel harassed and helpless. And I pray, God, that you administer to them, that you open up their hearts And Father, they would receive your word, and Father, that your word would come and do the very thing it's supposed to do, and that is to change and transform us from inside out. Lord, I thank you this morning for your presence here, and we know that you are here, and you can change, and you can transform, and we stand on the promises you've given us in the holy word. 
But Jesus would pray and everyone said, amen. Well, if you ever had a time where you kind of knew you were part of a ruined situation, but you kind of held on to hope, you thought maybe there's something that will happen out of this, then you'll know exactly what, what I mean when I say that uh, when I moved here to the city and Bellevue being as expensive as it is, um, I had to get a roommate. I still have a roommate because it's still expensive. Um, but, and, and this was about three years ago. And uh, his name was, he was, at that time, his name was Silas. Silas was a guy that wor- led worship at that time in North Campus and, and amazing guy. We never had any problems. But one time I went to California and I had to rent a different car because my car was too small to actually go on a road trip to California. And uh, I went there and in the middle of the church service, I get this text message from Silas and Silas says, hey Slavic, I, my car is getting worked on. Can I borrow your car? Right? And I'm like, well, he's never borrowed it before, but I know he's a safe driver, and I know he's a really good guy. And, and I'm like, yeah. And then I had another text message saying, as long as you don't crash it <laughs> or do anything to it. You know? And he's like, yeah, for sure, man. You know? I kid you not, 20, minute, 20 minutes later in service, I get a phone call from Silas. And, and I'm thinking like, well, that can't be good because you know, he knows I'm in service. He knows that I can only text, and he's calling me. And he calls me again, and I'm like, oof. And it makes you extremely uncomfortable, right? Like, and then I see a voicemail, and I do what you shouldn't be doing in church, where you just sort of pick it up and then just sort of listen, right? And it's him crying. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> so I step out, step out of the service, and I'm like, okay, what happened? And, and I listen to the voicemail, and I call him, and he's just crying. He's like, man, bro, the deer, man, the deer. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, deer. You know, like, <laughs> he's like, a deer, a deer jumped in front of me. And he's, and he's like, and it's, it's bad. The car is bad. <laughs> But the deer is fine because it ran away. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, well, it, how, how bad it could be, right? I'm like, just send me some pictures, man. Like, we'll, we'll figure this out, you know? So he sends me the picture in my beloved car, my sports car at that time. It's just like, you know, it's like, you know, like <laughs> just has this whole front end, you know, that's like all messed up. I mean, the hood is up and the lights are busted and the... And here I'm thinking, like, I mean, we, we can fix that. I mean, we put a wrap on it. <laughs> no, like, you're thinking, like, I'm sure, but deep down you know the car is totaled. Like, you know it's going to cost more to fix it than to actually total the car, right? And uh, I'm trying to comfort him, but at the same time I'm thinking, like, yeah, the car, the car is done. I don't know if you've ever been, had a situation like this where you're trying to hold on to hope knowing that the situation is ruined. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, the good thing is that I had full coverage and they called me and they said, I have some bad news for you. Um, your car is totaled, but we're gonna pay it off. And I'm like, that's good news actually. Like, but it was good the fact that I had insurance, they paid it off. But this is just a small story, right? I think the bigger things happen when you are dealt with a ruined situation and you have no idea how to get out of it. I mean, how do you face the reality that maybe you just got diagnosed with a terminal illness? Or maybe you have a drug addiction and no matter how many times you've said you will never be in this place, you find yourself in the same exact place and you realize that maybe other people are free, but for me, freedom just doesn't seem to, to, to get through. Or how do you find, when you find yourself in a situation where your marriage just, it just failed? When you're like, I don't know if I can ever recover from this. I think one of the culminating points of of, 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 of desperation comes when somebody in your family died. And now you realized that I have to live with this. There's nothing you can do to bring that person back. There's nothing you can do to, to change the circumstances that you find yourself in. What do you do in those moments where there is no insurance company to pay it off? 
There is no remedy for your situation. Somehow you are forced to live with this. What do you do in that situation? I think this is exactly the point where the enemy tries to, to get into your life because he sees a door of opportunity. I think desperation and, and being at a loss or when it comes to hope, you have no hope, you're hopeless. I think that's one of the worst positions that you can ever be in because you see, even if you're going through pain, but if there's hope that this pain is temporary, you can, you can get through that. Right? And when you go to the, to, uh, I had to have, I keep on getting my jaw, keeps on getting infected. I know it's disgusting, but like, and, and, and I know that when I go to the dentist and he starts to cut open my jaw, it's the most excruciating pain you can ever experience, even though he, he numbs it and all that. But I know that that pain is just for a moment and it'll leave and I'm gonna come home with a big jaw, but in a few days, I should be better. Right, so, so you can put yourself through situations like that where it's extremely painful because you know it's temporary. But what do you, what do, you do when there's a permanent to your pain? A loss that doesn't go away. Loneliness that always comes back. Depression that always seems like a cloud. You say hi to people and then just, it just never seems to go away. A kid who always goes back into hanging out with the wrong people and going back into drugs, and you're like, I've been praying and nothing seems to be happening. A marriage that's failing. Or you lost someone and now you have to live with that. And the enemy, a lot of times, he takes opportunity to discourage you even further. And that's what the enemy does a lot. What he starts first to do is to overwhelm and terrify you. So you can feel fear and no way out. Then he'll tempt you and accuse you He'll tempt you to get into a sin and then accuse you. you know, the, 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 the scripture says that he's the accuser of the brethren. right? He, 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 he'll get you to do a sin. He'll tempt you and then he'll remind you that Christians shouldn't be doing that. And what kind of Christian are you? And he'll accuse you before, before God. And after he's done with doing that, he, he will try to discourage you. Well, you. You always find yourself here. Might as well do it. Then he mocks you. He mocks the faith that you have. You know, if you're a real Christian, this shouldn't happen. You shouldn't be going through the same thing cycle over and over and over. And out of all people in the midst of a pandemic or when you're dealing with loss, you should have hope, but see, you don't have hope. So he mocks you. And then he, he will use your own addiction, your own problem, your own sin against you to constantly reel you back in. When you are having lustful thoughts, how do you get rid of your lustful thoughts? Because the more you think about it, the more entangled you get. When you think of, I'm just not gonna do it, not gonna do it, but then you fall yourself in the same trap because the more you think about it, the more entangled you get. Right? He'll use your own dysfunction, your own family dysfunction against you you're messed up because your dad was messed up. Your mom was messed up and therefore you cannot be a good mom. Dysfunction just runs into your family. You'll use any means necessary to, to, to discourage you, to, to remove any faith that you have, any hope left. And in this broken situation, this is where God himself steps in. That's what we see what he's done with Jesus. In our brokenness, Jesus, God himself, stepped in and became like one of us to experience the same pain, right? And that is what we preach every single morning. That Jesus, we have a high priest that knows our pain, that comes in the midst of our pain. And here's how we get to this chapter of Ezekiel 37. Well, we are told that the hand of the Lord has brought Ezekiel, who is a prophet, into this valley as a, this is more like, most likely a vision uh, that he sees of God taking him and he is surrounded by bones, dry bones. I mean, I don't really like hanging out at the cemetery. I just don't. Because cemetery always just reminds me of pain. Right, but imagine not only being at a place where the bones are six feet under, it's, they're everywhere. 
That's a creepy place to be in. Right? And it, 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 he tells us that it's, they're not just bones, they're dry bones. There's no sign of life is what this passage is trying to say. Because you see, if there's any kind of like, you know, uh, humidity, if there's any kind of marrow in those bone, bones, well, there's still some kind of life. But when they're so dry, there's, there's no sign of life what this passage is saying. Right? Just like when you look at the situations that you encounter daily and your, your family dysfunction, you're like, this is not going away, your depression, your loneliness. Or even when you have things that you celebrate because you got the promotion, got the money, and this is supposed to make you happy, but it does not. And you realize, am I ever going to be satisfied? I had a friend of mine who called me. He's about 28. I'm 35. And he calls me. He's like, Slavik, you know, I, I have a great wife. I have a great life. I have a great family. I have everything, but I just feel so still disappointed. I feel like I'm not really accomplishing things in, my, in life. And, and I'm like, welcome to the club. <laughs> and he's like, does that ever go away? And I'm like, no, it gets worse. <laughs> Because you do get the car and the house and all of those things, and then you realize, but it's still broken. It's still, it still, it, it doesn't deliver the joy promised. The only thing that keeps me going every single morning is knowing the, who I am in Christ and knowing that I'm not temporary here, that I have a life eternal. And the Son of God, God himself cared so much for me that gave his life for me and died for me. And yes, at times you mourn your youth, but also the more I get closer to eternity, I look forward to his appearing. That's what keeps me going. So I try to encourage him, but I'm like, well, uh, there's an uh, American poet uh, um, that, that said this. I, I think his name is Henry David Thoreau, and he says that most men, that includes women too, um, that's the old language, <laughs> most men live lives of quiet desperation. <laughs> they're, just, they're just in despair, but they're quiet about it, <laughs> right? Like, if we're not in Christ, it's just disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. And in this dysfunction, in this moment, this is what Ezekiel sees. Ezekiel, as I mentioned, I think previously, uh, last time, Ezekiel lives in a time where the people of Babylon, this, this overpowering rulers came over and destroyed Jerusalem. And they took the Jews into captivity. And they took their king, Zedekiah, and, and he, they made the king watch all his kids being slaughtered in front of, them, in front of him. And then he, they gouged his eyes and brought him to Babylon in slavery. So their king is gone. Their people are in slavery. Jerusalem is in ruins. The house of the Lord has been plundered and destroyed and all the art and everything is taken over to Babylon. And in this dysfunction, the word of God comes to Ezekiel and he shows him this vision of dry bones. And the question is, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Kind of like how God walks up to us this morning and asks us about that dysfunction in your family, or well, whatever I just mentioned before, whatever you associate with, and God this morning is asking you this, can there be life in this? Can you see joy in this pain? Can you see joy in your suffering? Can you see joy in what you thought is gonna bring success, it did, it did not, Maybe you've been looking at it the wrong way. Maybe you've been looking at that as your savior. Money is a great servant. It's just a horrible master. Right, right. So, so that is the question that God asks of Ezekiel. Can these bones live? Can this room situation? It's like, I mean, nobody goes to a boneyard and exhumes a, a body that's been dead for 12 years. No doctor does this. And you have a skeleton there, and people ask, doctor, is there potential? No. What do you mean? This person's been dead for 12 years, just a skeleton left. What do you mean is there potential? But that's what God does to Ezekiel. Can these bones live? Right? And I think that's the question every single time when we see the dysfunction in our society. 
and you're, you're so quick to take sides. I think God, we, 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 we are not to be on the side of this, this group of people or on this group of people, but we need to speak the word of God in these places. And Ezekiel gives in what I would say is the greatest line in human history is, you know, God comes to him and says, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, meaning, meaning Ezekiel answered, oh, Lord God, you know. <laughs> the answer there is no. <laughs> like the answer, can these bones live? Any doctor will tell you, no, there's no potential. They're very dry. And even if they were not dry, there's still no potential. And even if it's just a dead body, there's still no potential. Because it's been dead for a while, quite frankly. So, so, so I wonder if Ezekiel is thinking like, is this a trick question, God? Is seriously right now? Yeah, there's just a lot of bones here. And I've, I've yet to see, I've yet to see these bones live. But he does something amazing. He says, God, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. My opinion doesn't really matter. What I do know is if you say they will live, they will live. God, you know the answer to this. And it's funny because if you look at this situation, you're like, well, there's no potential. But if we believe in a God who can make life out of dust, why is it so hard for us to believe that God can make life in dry bones? If we believe in the power of God's word that spoke the galaxies into existence when he said, let there be all of this. If we believe in the God's word that, that was able to separate light from darkness at the sound of his voice, can we not believe that God can raise these bones again? If we believe in the God who, uh, one word, he, he brought all kinds of creatures into existence from the depths of the sea to the heights of the sky of the birds and so on. God spoke all of that into existence. And something amazing happens when we are asked about, hey, can you speak life in this situation? Can there be hope in this? Something amazing happens when you don't tell your opinion, but you say, you know what? If God says this is going to live, this is going to live. When we don't put our opinions, we say, God, I'm just going to agree with you. Lord, I know that you called us to disciple people. Therefore, I will go and preach the gospel. Lord, I know that you do not like when people are walking in disease and sicknesses. So I'm going to pray for the sick to be restored. Lord, I know that it's not your will for the demon possessed to be demon possessed. So I will pray for deliverance. Lord, I'm just going to agree with you on this. Because quite frankly, my word doesn't doesn't bear any fruit. What does bear fruit is what you say. And when I know that when I agree with what you have to say, then things happen, amazing things happen. And you would think that God would say, okay, well, I'd choose choose for these bones to to come alive. But that's not what happens in verse four. he He says, then he said to me, prophesy, over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So God gives Ezekiel the task to prophesy. Now prophecy can be foretelling and foretelling. So Foretelling is basically when something will happen and you see it and you say, hey, this will happen. But foretelling is something that has not happened yet, but you speak it into existence, not by using your word, by speaking God's word. Right? So this is what, what happens in this, in this place where God looks at Ezekiel and says, Ezekiel, look to these bones and prophesy to them. <laughs> Going to the cemetery and preaching your best sermon, you're still preaching to dead people. Right? No matter how good you are, no matter how loud you are, you're still preaching to a dead crowd. And you look like a fool. But that's what God tells Ezekiel to do. He says, prophesy to these bones. In a sense, preach to these bones. And I 
will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. It says that if you do that, when, when you agree with God and you take God's word, not your word, God's word, and you speak it over your dead situation. Now, of course, I understand this is written to the people of Israel, but I think there's spiritual lessons that we can learn from here. Then when you look over your addiction and say, you know what, Lord, I don't, I don't know what to say anymore, but I will declare your word over my life. Lord, I'm constantly in fear. I will declare your word over my life. I'll declare your word over my family, over my spouse. Lord, I'm gonna declare your word over our church, over everything that I am. Lord, I'm gonna declare you, I'm gonna agree with you. And Lord, I'm gonna speak that into existence, not because my word is powerful, but because I just agree with you and I'm your mouthpiece. This is not my opinion. Lord, use me as a mouthpiece. Lord, use my hands to go up to the sick person and lay my hands and let you be the, the, the person who, who brings the power, but I'll be the vessel through which the power comes through. Lord, would you come and as I lay my hand, the power of God will come and heal this person. You can't just say, well, Lord, I just agree with you. Should we see people saved in Bellevue? Yeah, Lord, I think it's a great idea. God says, no, you go and you preach the word. You make disciples. You pray for the sick. You deliver the demonized. You go take action. That is what we're called to. Is, it's not faith, just, just believe, but faith in action. You go and intercess. Not just agree, but you take action. He says, and I, 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 I've done that, right? And he says, so I prophesied and I've commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there was sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And this amazing thing happens where he preaches and, and the bodies, the bones start to, to rattle together and they start to come. I mean, what a sight that would be. I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd also like to see when dead people spiritually come alive. It's a beautiful sight. To see bodies coming together and what used to be dry bones, now there's some sign of potential life, but they're still dead. There's still no breath in them. Because I see a lot of times we come to church because we want God to take our drug addiction away. We want God to take your sin away, whatever that sin is. And you come and you experience that freedom. Maybe you were dealing with de demon possession and you were freed from that demon, but the Bible makes it very clear that if you are just free from a demon, he will go into the desert and come back. And if the house is just empty, he will take residence once again. So just because, you know, as, as a church, if all we do is feed the homeless, they're still dead spiritually. If as a church, that's all we do is take care of people's physical needs to make sure their bodies are whole and they're fed, they're still dead dead spiritually, and they're still lost for eternity. And that's what's happened here is that, yes, the bodies now, they look like, you know, somebody's asleep, but there's still no breath in them. Maybe you came to Jesus, you gave your life, but you need to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is the seal that we are saved. He lives inside of us. He keeps us saved. He's the one, the Holy Spirit is the one who starts a good work in us and he's the one who will complete it in us. And that's what happens in verse seven, right? This is obviously not necessarily a direct correlation, but this is what it happens as a means of analogy, right? So I prophesied as I, as I, and, I was, um, and I was commanded. 
As I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling of the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, the sinews on them, and the flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And verse 9, and he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain and they may live. So I prophesied and as he commanded and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. So the breath of God comes and indwells the dead bodies and now they become alive. Now they're an army army that you shouldn't be messing with, right? In verse 11, we are told, and then he said to me, the Lord said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your grave and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord and I open the graves and you raise and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. So God himself speaks to the house of Israel and says, there comes a day, right now you're, you're looking at this whole situation of you being homeless because you're in Babylon in slavery, you can't even go back to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is no longer there. It's destroyed. It's in ruins. And you feel like everything, all hope that you have, your king is dead. All that you have left is just hopelessness. And God says, prophesy to my people and tell them that I will bring them back. I'll restore them back to the land. Now we know in history that that, that does happen. There's a physical, you know, the, 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 the children of Israel were exiled and there's a physical coming back into the promised land. But the promise doesn't just stop there. The promise that we're told here is that God himself will renew them spiritually, not just physically and back to their land, but also spiritually. And this is how we come to even today. You see, we are not, some of us are Jewish here, but most of us are not, right? And, and, and even though the promises were for the children of Israel, there was a time in the New Testament where the Gentiles, what we've been known as Gentiles, were grafted in. We were adopted in God's family. And we are told that we were dead in our trespasses in Ezekiel 2, right? I'm sorry, Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So it's not just Jerusalem and Israelites that are spiritually per se dead. We too were once dead. We too walked in the desires of the flesh and in sin. And we were following the, the direction, following the prince of the power of the air, meaning this is a reference to the enemy, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We didn't want to be obedient to God. It was the Holy Spirit who came and convicted us of our sin and granted us repentance. How do you, how do you resurrect a dead person? Do you give them vitamins? Do you talk to a dead person telling them you would be better if they were alive? Right? In the Old Testament, we have this phrase, is it better to be an alive dog than a dead lion? Right? I mean, how do you convince a dead person that it's better to be alive? You can't, they're dead. You can't feed them vitamins or anything because they're dead. The only way to, to bring something that's dead alive is only by the power of the one who actually brought us alive to begin with. 
He's the only one who can bring a dead person alive. We can't. So if as a church we think that our intellect can convince people to no longer be spiritually dead, we are dead wrong. If we think by giving them niceties and welcoming them here with cookies, now cookies are awesome, and so is coffee in the morning. But if all they get when they come here is that, that doesn't change much. You can feed a dead person as much, as much vitamins as you want and you can convince them, but they're not hearing you because they're dead. What we need is supernatural ability that God has to call out Lazarus out of the grave. Because you see, I'm also reminded of that fatal and, and the most destructive and also the most hopeless circumstances in history called the cross. We just celebrated you know, the Resurrection Sunday just about a few weeks ago. And on Resurrection Sunday, when the disciples thought that everything is lost, that there's no more hope, that the Messiah that they followed for three years is laying dead in the tomb. Oh, how wrong they were. Because on that third day, God himself kicked the door open and Jesus defeated the enemy and also defeated death. So what's worse than death? Well, what's worse than death is the second death, is to be lost for eternity. Before this moment, I remember I was working for this dealership um, in some, I think it was like 2007. And uh, I was so scared about everything. I'm like, I don't want to make a mistake. And I remember the finance guy took me outside and said, Slavik, one of the worst things that could ever happen to you is if you died. And I'm like, well, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and he said, war, if someone that you love dies. And I'm like, okay, well, where are you going with this? He said, everything else is fixable. So put things in perspective. Just because you made a mistake, we, we can fix that. Right? So I'm telling you that if God, through his son Jesus, defeated death, there's nothing left for you to fear. If you are walking in him, then no power of hell, no death could ever make us fear. So whatever the circumstance you're dealing with this morning, if it's maybe a, a, a disease that doesn't seem to go away or a sickness where it may be a broken situation at home, I wanna ask you to do two things and that is the only two things that I can come up with that can actually bring a change in your life. And that is to agree with the Lord and preach into your, into your life and to that situation God's words, because they have power. My words don't have power. It's God's words that change things. And the second thing is that you pray. They intercede. That is where the power lies. Now, all the other th things that we do at church is awesome. But if you want a change in your circumstance, this is what you need to do, is understand that you can't bring things that are dead to life by trying to convince those dead bodies, by trying to feed them niceties and vitamins. But understanding has to be a supernatural work of God. Whenever you talk to a coworker who doesn't believe, you have to realize that they're blind because they're following the prince of the air. It's not my thoughts. These are what the Bible says. They can't even see the truth. So, so what you need to do is pray that God would open their eyes first and declare God's word over their lives. And if we have this amazing, amazing, you know, experience that there's no longer nothing to fear, but there's also something to be excited for. Because you see, Jesus didn't just save us out of fear for us just to be bored. No, he saved us from our sin. He saved us from our dysfunction, from our brokenness, not for us to just stay neutral and be bored. He saved us for an eternity with him. 
He saved us for a joy with him for eternity. That is the greatest, most exciting thing about heaven is not the things that are there, but because God is there. The source of all life is there. The source of all joy and satisfaction is there. The things that God has prepared for us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Now, how do I describe to you the glory of God? If, I, if you've never seen a wristwatch, and I'm describing it to you, I can say, well, it's a leather band, and then it has this thing that goes in circles and tells time, and you can read it, and there's different kinds of people. Most people wear it just because it looks nice. Right? Like, you can describe to the point where that person has a pretty good idea what you're describing. But imagine trying to describe beauty. That's just beautiful. Describe it. It just is. <laughs> just is. That's all you need to know. But you recognize beauty. When I, my mom, um, she would bake these like massive, like because we bake for the whole week in Moldova, and I'd come from school and there was this like bake smell that he just I associated with our house, and it's been some 25 years, that old, right? like, and every single time I go to a bakery and I'm like, this reminds me of home. Or there's a perfume that I've been wearing for the last I don't know 12 years, and it just just reminds me of home, and I don't know why I keep on buying the same thing, because it's expensive, but it's just Colonia. Sorry, thank you <laughs> for the correction. Now I know. Um, it reminds me of specific places in my life. You know, when you listen to that song, and it just kind of hits the right note, and you have to pause, like, hang on, Th this song, this song just, just, I don't know what it does, but it's just, I need to, to pause. What poets are called being arrested by a beauty where, where you are watching the sunset and you're like, this is just perfect and the picnic and the sunset. So see, you can't really describe, I mean, you can point to things and say, well, that's beautiful, right? But some person might not agree with you. Beauty, it's not so much that you can describe, it has to be recognized. Right, same thing with the glory of God. How do I describe the glory of God to you? The beauty of Christ. How do I describe God's presence to you? I can't. All I can do is tell you to experience it. To recognize it. Because when you spend time in God's presence, things change. The way you think changes. The way you go about life changes. Just like Moses Spending time in God's presence. First, he came down, he broke the, the, the tablets with the law because he was angry. But the second time he came, after he spent time in God's presence, people had to cover his face because he was radiating God's beauty and, and glory. So Jesus didn't just save us from our dysfunction, our brokenness, just for us to be bored, bored but he saved us for an eternity with him an eternity to experience the beauty of Christ, the beauty of heaven, the beauty of us being a community. Have you thought about that day when all of us, and I hope it's all of us, meet together there? And you remember the broken and the prayers at the altar? Can you just Picture with me that moment when we walk in and we're at the Lamb's Supper and you're amongst the, the saints of ages and you can walk up and talk to Joseph and Moses and look around and say, these are God's redeemed. All of them are creatures. God has created them, but then the Son of God died for them and they became adopted into the family of God. And they're no longer a statue, or they're no longer a creature, they're the redeemed. Imagine you developing a statue and adopting into your family. So this is where it leads me. Lord, if you're gonna save us from our brokenness, from our sin, why the theater? Why can't you just snap us into perfection right away? 
Why the pain? Maybe it has to do with, with the fact that when we go through the brokenness and Jesus Christ gives his life for us, for our sin, we're no longer creatures. We are the redeemed. We are part of God's family. We were once lost and dead, but now we're alive and in his family. And the same God who spoke everything into existence, who spoke a person, made him out of clay, breathed into his nostrils, and made him alive, can bring healing to your body. That's the same God we serve. The same God who delivered so many people, so many of, of, of Israelites from the enemies and from demons can deliver you and your family this morning. The same God who, who created everything that we see can bring healing in your circumstance. And of course, you might still have scars, but maybe scars are not there to remind you of your pain, but remind you that there is healing so I'm not sure how you came in this morning. Maybe you're looking around and maybe you're 30 or 40 and you're thought, man, I thought I would have it by now and I thought by now I'd feel joy and satisfaction, but my life is broken and I'm lonely and I'm depressed and my family's falling apart. And the question I think the Lord is asking this morning is, can you look at this situation and say, can this live? And surely the answer, just agree with the Lord. Say, Lord, you know. I, I, I don't know, but you know. And whatever the answer is, Lord, I'm going to agree with that. And I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to stand on your promises. And Lord, I, I, I will take and I'll take you on your word and declare that over my life, declare that over my family, declare that over my dysfunction, over my sin. And I know that way you start in me through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will bring completion. So if you've not made Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, I want to invite you this morning to do that. I don't know, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I wish to tell you what a specific food <laughs> tastes like, but until you taste it, you'll never know. Certain beauties and certain things, they, they have to be experienced. You can't describe it. And I hope, just like the Lord Jesus has made it such a difference in my life and made my life worth living and gave me hope. And if tomorrow I walk out of this place and get hit by a bus, I know the same God called Lazarus out of the grave is going to call me on the resurrection day out of the grave. And as much as I love every single one of you, if I have to choose between you and the Lord, I'll see you after. <laughs> right? Like, that is our hope. And if you've been walking with the Lord, and I encourage you to practice declaring over your life His word, spending time in intercessory prayer over your family, and say, Lord, I don't really know, I don't really see it, but I'm just going to agree with you on this because I know you can deliver. I, I know you can restore. So I'm gonna ask you, could you rise to your feet and I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. I'm gonna lead you in prayer and then I'm gonna hand it back to the worship team. But if you have not made Jesus as your Lord and Savior with everyone's eyes closed, would you raise your hand? I wanna see if there's anybody here that you wanna give your life to Jesus. I'm not gonna call you up front. I just wanna pray for you. I don't see anybody. I'm not sure if it's the lights where if you have not made Jesus your, as your personal Lord and Savior, I'd love to pray for you. I don't see any hands. If you're too shy to raise your hand, I'd love to talk to you after. So I'm assuming that I'm talking to people who have made Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I'm going to ask you now to declare whatever the Holy Spirit is going to bring you to your mind right in this moment. He's bringing a situation that you need to speak God's word over. Could you start declaring that over? Say, Lord, I, I, I'm going to trust you on this. I'm going to speak life in the midst of death. I'm going to speak healing in the midst of disease and sickness. I'm going to speak deliverance in the midst of, of possession and, and, and oppression.
on me. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your presence this morning.